Okay, let's all smile. Oh, we're all smiling like mad as soon as a silly voice talks. <laughs> That's a silly voice, it does make you talk. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> it's lovely and sunny here. Is it lovely and sunny up there? It is, with a nice breeze to keep the midges away. Yes. That's always a good idea in Scotland. Um, oh, yes. Um, we've got a good breeze down here, but we don't have midges in the same way. But it's a nice well, one. It's particularly important for the horses since one of them is allergic to these midge bites. It'd be particularly important for me if I was up there because I'm Absolutely. pretty allergic to midge bites too. Yeah. <laughs> we've been there, we've done that. We are not talking about midge bites this morning. No. Moving on. What are we talking about? We're going to talk about fear. Well, we're going to start. We're going to start with fear. We're going to move on from fear, which is what yeah. everyone should do anyway. Yes, quite so. Absolutely. But fear, so, fear, is, fear is a very natural thing. Fear is a very useful thing sometimes. Mm. Uh, it's vital if you're being chased by something. Absolutely. If you're not scared, you get run over. Mm. <laughs> so, or eaten, or whatever, depending on your species. So, yeah, fear is useful, but it can also be... What's the opposite of useful? Not useless. It can actually be a hindrance. It can actually disempower you. It can, Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I keep meeting people because I'm doing this um, Love Nature Festival, which is really going well and all that kind mm. of thing. And, and these zero carbon people in Shropshire, and they're doing their very best, and all sorts of other people that I know. And everybody's a bit like this. It's my version of looking fearful. Yes. Um, what are you finding up there? There's a lot of fear around. A lot of it is fear of things that people can't do anything about. Yes. Well, think they can't do anything about. A lot of it is people can't, people can't do anything about, mm. uh, as well as the things they think they can't do anything about. Mm. I mean, some things are pretty universal. Everyone's scared of where energy prices are going, for instance. Yes. But what can you do? You've got to eat, you've got to heat. You've yes. got to get around somehow. Um, the energy prices are going to affect your food and all this kind of thing. So Absolutely. that's a very justifiable fear. And um, But there's not much you can do about it. Well, we could have a revolution. We could, but we need a few more people on board first. Yes. Two so people is not so much a revolution. Please come and help the revolution. Yes. I can't remember that 1960s phrase, but there was this wonderful revolution skit comedy show program it was really great anyway um being the revolution but we do need to and nobody's going to listen if we all talk nicely unfortunately i'm afraid not no, no. talking nicely means they continue to ignore you and just walk on your head yeah i i've noticed that particularly because uh, we've got a very a partly very good xr group um extinction rebellion group yes. um up here around me and there's some people who really see where we are really see the problems with energy prices really see the problem that we need to stop using fuel you know, uh, oil mm. um and that, that is a big problem that we can if we can stop using oil then that is actually something we can do about fuel prices it is yes but <sighs> getting there i'll i'll put that people let, let, me just, let me just flip that over slightly because here in scotland we actually produce a lot more green energy than we use we we generally produce 97 percent of our energy as green energy wind energy particularly offshore wind and solar energy and some hydro energy and yet our prices are much much higher than england's and it's not the price of fuel that's no. directly affecting us no. It's the price of wholesale energy on the world market. Exactly. And uh, so no matter how green we are, we need the rest of the world to give up oil, please, hurriedly. So this takes me right back to, yes, vive the revolution. Absolutely. But that's not where we are this morning. Because no. we're really getting excited. And we did say about five minutes ago that we weren't going to get into that too much. Is there a Let's stick with the kinds of fears of things that we might be able to do something about more easily than starting revolution. Absolutely. Um, let's see. 
common fears at the moment around here are the, the, the fear that you won't be able to feed your family. Yeah. And common fears down here are similar, but mm. also there's a big fear, and I suppose I'm getting this from um, the Love Nature Festival of people a lot, and the zero carbons, um, there's a big fear that we're not going to get anything done in time. Absolutely, yes. So there's all that kind of thing. And the fear of losing your house, losing your job, and then all that brings in, and this is particularly, I, I do quite a bit of, um, well, I do some relationship work um, in the coaching and that. And um, so you're afraid and your partner's afraid. And so you end up like this at each other. Yes, yes. Um, when you're actually you're both on the same team. Yes. But he's not saying it like you want him to, and you're not saying it like he wants you to. Yeah, I heard it summed up once as stop agreeing so violently. Yeah, that's brilliant, actually. Yeah, yes. stop agreeing so violently. I'm, I must use that, mm. and I offer it to people when they, when they come telling me that's what they're doing. Yes. Or showing me that's what they're doing more. Like. A lot of it, a lot of it is because people are scared and they're frustrated because they're not able to do things. Which takes us to another thing. Mm. That um, I mean, Fiona and I have known each other for a quarter of a lifetime. Hell <laughs> <laughs> of a bloody long time, anyway. And um, when I'm scared, I get on the um, WhatsApp or the Messenger or something. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> <laughs> they do exactly the same thing. Yes, it's fine. And so I've got somebody I'm not scared to talk about being scared with. Yes. And this is really, really, really important. Um, you've got to have somebody that you're not scared of being scared with. Or, yes. Or talking about being scared with. Mm. Because you can't express it otherwise. And you and need to express it. You do. And very often, and this can be more of a female thing, but I have actually seen it very well in lots of men or male people. Um, I, think, I think in some ways it's much harder for men because of the sexual stereotyping. Men are supposed to be big and brave and strong and you don't get scared and you can always handle everything. Yeah, oh, I, I, I can handle a saber-toothed tiger on my own with my legs tied. Yes. Absolutely. It's complete tosh. Totally. You're human. You're all human. But the other side of that is, um, and this is what I was going with the female thing, mm. is many people, I mean, lots of female have, females have children. Yes. And they like having children and they're mothers. And they actually like being mothers. But they take mothering to such an extreme that they take it to suffocating. Well, and it, they try and, I mean, I get mothered. I am 70 something or another. It's, it's and I get 40 something yes, year old yes. women mothering me. <laughs> it's, not, it's not mothering. It's not mothering. I'm gonna I'm gonna change the spelling. It's okay. Mothering. That's a good one. Yes. On no form today. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're totally on form. She she did um message me earlier. I, I, I my brain's fried. I don't know what I'm doing. But obviously <laughs> the tea has worked. Her brain yes. is not fried anymore. But yeah, I agree. But we tend to, well, I can't tell him how scared I am because that'll upset him. Or I can't tell her how scared I am because that'll upset her. Whereas, in fact, if you share it, you both feel better. And Remember the old, pro the old proverb? Yeah. The problem shared is well, problem halved. That's right. You and it each other. very often is. I mean, that's partly why we're both in the um, coaching and counselling jobs that we are. Absolutely, yes. Because we're, we're the other half of the sharing bit. And, and we do actually shut up when we're with clients. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let the client do the talking. Honestly, we don't blather off our heads all the we, time. We can listen. We're very good at listening. <laughs> we are. But it wouldn't make a very interesting blog. No, if we just sat and go. Mm. No, don't work. Um, but we do, we've got this thing that we mustn't hurt somebody else. We mustn't put our fears on somebody else. We mustn't upset somebody else. We mustn't make them feel bad. But very likely, 
they would quite like somebody to share with too. Mm. And if we offer that up, if you have an underlying worry that you've been hiding, and then, then your you know your partner or your friend comes out and shares it with you, you're able to share, you're able to relax, you can express yourself, and you both come out of it feeling better. Yeah. So don't worry about hurting other people. Well, and that's it. Yeah, no. I mean, don't, try don't. it. I mean, sometimes it just has to come out. I mean, yes. there are times when we both have to just scream our pain at each other. Yes. Um, I've done it with a couple of other people I've got who I can scream with. But mm. otherwise, it's to say, I've got this thing. Can I share it with you? And 10 to 1, the person will say, oh, what is it? Mm. And you open up. And then Miss Piana said, let me open up. It's, it's one of the things that humans are particularly good at. Normal, well-adjusted humans enjoy oh, helping yeah. other people. <laughs> But we are, we are a social species. We enjoy helping others. And we enjoy being helped by others. Yes. And that's the other side of this fear thing. You are allowed to be afraid. Absolutely. You are allowed to be, I haven't got a bloody clue what's going on. I don't it's know what to do. It's absolutely fine to say, I need help. I don't we know. We all need help sometimes. Yeah. And when somebody says, well, what do you need help with? I don't know. That's the problem. And that's okay. Yes. It really is. Of course, one of my brothers remarked when I was a particularly difficult, obstreperous, you know, small one once, hand me a box of hankies. We're going to do psychological warfare. <laughs> I love that. Was that Gordon? No, it was Martin. Martin, yeah, he's good too. <laughs> yeah, about eight or nine at the time. I think that's absolutely brilliant. In fact, you're going to have to remind me of that one again because I need I need to borrow it or share it. I need yes. to share it with you. Absolutely. That's fine. Yes. So you can share your fear. And if you can't find any friends who could actually handle it, and sometimes people can't handle it, they might say, not now, I actually just need to go and bury my head in a pillow or something. Yes. And that's fine too. Um, then look for somebody maybe like us yes there are lots of other people as well um, who can be there for you and in that sense that is really important once you've got that then there's somewhere for your fear to go mm. but what if you don't do it you end up with the next thing that we would put on our list is you end up totally frustrated you do, yes. And the, the problem with frustration is it ricochets around your life. Yeah. You and know, around everybody else's life. And everyone else's that you come into contact with. You know, if, if you're frustrated because, you know, you dropped the milk at breakfast and you didn't get your coffee, then you go out and, you, you know, you find yourself doing road rage. And then you get everyone else annoyed. Mm -hmm. And it, it just goes on and on like some sort of stray bomb going through everyone's lives. And you get to your workplace and everybody says, oh, morning, Fiona. And you're like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and everyone goes, oh, what? And some people, that frightens. Some people are more like me who probably say, oh, she's got one on again. I'll go put <laughs> yeah. the kettle on. Um, but you've got to be in a good place yourself to be able to say that. And not everyone is. Particularly. You may even find the occasional person who's, who's solid enough to go, you want to talk about anything here? Mm. Are you okay today? Yeah. Yeah. Pass me the hankies. We're going to do psychological warfare. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. We need more Martins in the business. We place. do. We do. A very good one. person. That yes. kind of thing. We definitely do. But it is important. I mean, that's another thing. I mean, I don't know whether you, some of you probably do lead a team or a part of a team or something or have some kind of responsibility in that way. And that's part of that leading thing. Mm. You know, sometimes you just have to put self on hold, box of tissues, we're going to do psychological warfare. And you've got to give that team member the time. And yes, it's going to take 10 minutes, half an hour out of the working day, but you might get better work after you've done it. 
Absolutely. Rather than worrying about losing a half hour of work. Yes. And if but it, it makes a huge difference to the loyalty in your workforce. Oh, goodness me, yes. Um, being but I, I currently have a part-time job that, that I work for one company, but I'm employed through an agency. And the agency are such a bunch of shits, I would cheerfully push them off, off a sinking ship. But the company I actually work for, the people I work with, are totally, totally ace, ace people, really nice people. You know, you, you go into work in the morning and they've got your back. And that's an incredible feeling. It is. And it's a real team thing. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that if you feel frustrated. And I mean, even if it's only a little bit, if it's a bit antsy or anything, it's still going to, It just for a minute, everybody, just take 15 seconds and think about something that really grates with you that makes you cross and frustrated and antsy. And just, just do it. For... Okay. Well, what happened to me was I suddenly found I was gritting my teeth. Yep. Um, my thigh and buttock muscles were clenched. My stomach was going. And if you keep that up much more than a couple of minutes, you'll start getting a headache and a neck ache, and your shoulders will go stiff. Mine already. And before you know it, before you know it, your back's out of line. And all the necessary nutrients are not getting to your brain either. Absolutely. So um, you know, you you your brain is fried. Yes, you won't be thinking right. You won't be working right, and that's really important too. So you need to look at frustration. You need to not again look at it on your own. I'm getting slightly distracted here. I'm sorry about this. Baby rabbits behind the camera, and they've just been cleaned out this morning. And I've got zoomies going on around the cage. So please what, excuse. What I'm it keeps going. Boing! Please excuse. The other members of Fiona's listening team. Mm. Absolutely. Because when you, when you work with Fiona, um, you get it with one with me because with, there is the cat. And Kellen is a very good listener and helper and all this sort of thing. But there's a whole myriad if you go to Fiona's. Oh, I have a menagerie. And they all listen and they all help you with frustration. Mm. And they help you with the next bloody thing that comes out of frustration, which is being stuck. Yes. Who doesn't feel stuck a bit at the moment? I do. And those two things feed off each other. Yeah. The more frustrated you are, the more you feel stuck. The more you feel stuck, the more frustrated you get. It's a nasty, vicious cycle. And it just keeps winding you up. It does. And underneath it is this root of fear. Mm. And that has gone frustration. Stuck. Frustration. You showered with shavings. And, um, so you actually need to get showered in shavings by a set of bunnies. Now that sounded like a wonderful piece of alliteration there. Yes. But, um, <laughs> but what you need is someone to tell, to talk to, um, and someone to share with. Mm. And the other half of that is that, and this is something to learn for yourself is if you can listen, other people can listen to you. And this is, sounds like catch 22. How do I listen if I, if I can't be heard? Um, and it's a bastard, but there yes. are ways through it. There are even simple little ways, um, which is certainly up on, on my website at the moment. Um, a set of seven little video courses that you can you can do, and yeah. they include asking and listening and hearing properly and all this kind of rubbish and noticing and stuff. Um, so those are a little starter for ten that might get you a little bit further, but you do need to be able to express all this shit. You do. It's actually happening. 
I've just, I've just remembered something that happened to me many years ago, which it pretty much sums up where we're going with this entire segment, I think. And it was quite simple. I was driving somewhere and I came around a corner and the car hit a flood. And the next thing I know, I'm up to the door sills, stalled in the middle of a huge flood. And it, it was a puddle some 20 foot long and perhaps eight inches deep. And because I hadn't been expecting it, I hit it all wrong in the wrong gear, handled it wrong and stalled in the middle of it. And it wasn't a very well traveled road. And I, I'm sort of sitting there looking at this car, which was a fairly big hefty car. And there was no way I was gonna push it out the puddle by myself. No phone signal in those days, cause it was pre-mobile phones. So I hopped out up to my knees in, well, up to my shins in water and flagged down the next thing to come along the road, which turned out to be a minibus. And just imagine my joy. So the moment the driver opened the window and said, are you stuck? And I went, yes, I need help. A rugby team piled out the back. Oh, I have never seen a car pushed out of a flood so fast in my life. Oh my God. Oh, that's fantastic. That's what we need to do. Yeah. yeah. If you're stuck, reach out, ask for help, get pushed out of that flood. And that reached out thing is so important. And again, yes. it's something that we both help people with because people sort of say, oh, well, that was just luck and coincidence. Well, coincidence just means two things happening or more than two things happening at the same time. Yes. It doesn't mean to say it's stupid, unusual, unlikely or rubbish, which is what people usually mean by mm. when they say coincidence. And so it doesn't mean it's inevitable and it's not your fault. And luck. And lots and lots, and lots. There's ancient adages on this is you actually make your own luck. And there are loads of adages all around the world in all the old traditions, all the old ways that tell you that. And that's about believing that there is, an, well, believing that there is something out there which will listen and does listen. And produces I've a repeat out of thin air from time to time when you need one. I've had incidences like Fiona's not in a flood, but you know, when I needed help desperately and I've just gone, help inside my head. And um, I got rescued by this woman once from a, a rather nasty situation. And she just came around the corner and um, I don't know, she was really sharp, opened the door and said, get in. Hmm. And I was saved. Um, I, I've had one I here. I like the rugby yeah. clubs though, because they're usually quite good looking blokes. Yes, and nice and big and messy. I, I've had one here with some of the animals. One, one of my menagerie here is a gander. Now the male goose is a territorial sort of bloke. And I, if he doesn't know you, he's going to let you know about it. He doesn't, doesn't give his trust easily. He's been with me three years and we're now... Well, I did have to put an upturned empty bucket on his head the other day. I was rather close. Yeah, to this him. isn't cruel, honestly. Honestly, it, it, really well, it was. A, it was a case of I either put the bucket over his head or he puts his beak in my bum. So, <laughs> being goose by a goose. Self-preservation, yes. Mm. So, I I turned around just in time to see him coming at me with his beak like that, going, "I'm going to get you." Bucket. <laughs> he went into the bucket, stopped, and went home. <laughs> and he backed out of it again, and it was like, "Okay, I've made my point. You've made yours. We're fine. I'll just step away from your nest then." So. You know, ganders are tricky beasts. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want a small child left alone with one, let's put it that way, because no. you probably wouldn't get your small child back in one piece. No. But while he was still settling in with me, another of my, my menagerie here is a very large and somewhat emotionally traumatised draft horse. And there was one day as I was trying to cross the yard with two buckets of water, one in each hand, and Hannibal the gander attached himself to the back of my left knee. And he wasn't letting go. He was winding himself up for beating with the wings, which is the next stage up from I've got you in my beak. By the way, ganders do sort of have teeth in their beak. They do have a serrated it beak hurts. and they have a lot of force in it. They can hurt. Uh, and George the horse emerged out of the barn, seeing me stood there with buckets, put his ears back and sort of bore down on me with, with a sort of an, a discouraging expression on his face. It basically <laughs> said, 
you're in my space and it's about 20 foot across and you can just bug off now. And as you can imagine, there's me stood on, on one leg with a, a goose attached to one leg, a horse coming at me. And I looked at him and went, help. Literally just said, help. And, and he walked straight past me and blew the goose off my leg. One huge snort and the gander sort of went, okay, your field, and backed off. <laughs> Which was not what I expected at all. But mm. I was very grateful to George for getting rid of the gander. <laughs> So yes, you just need to reach out and say help sometimes. And yeah. it comes from the most unexpected places. And again, that is something that um, comes in, in the work that we both do, that we, we teach you. We don't we sort of do teach. You know, it's going to have to use the word teach because I can't think of another one. Yes. Um, but we help you find out then. Let's try that. Help you find out how to do this your way. Yes, we facilitate. That's a good one. Hmm. Sounds a bit sooty, but I'll live with it. It, it does, but <laughs> we actually, we don't teach so much as we enable you to learn. Yeah. And we offer suggestions about, well, what, how about trying this? Or have you thought about yes. that kind of thing? So, um, and we can do that. And we're hoping um, and gradually getting together that we can do, it won't be till later this year now, that we can do um, little workshops or retreats or um, I'm really back into vision quests again, Fiona. Mm. Yes. Because it's like finding your own vision. Yes. And so like- It has to be, to it has to be your own vision, your it's own way. It. That's the point. Because one of the things I think that sits at the bottom of a lot of all the things we've discussed so far- Particularly fear. The fear, the frustration, the being stuck is the fact that we're disconnected and we're stuck in somebody else's script. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So what we try and do is we try and help you find your own script and connect, to reconnect both with your own true self, your authentic self, that wild self that is you at heart. Yes. And with the natural will. Mm. Everything um, that's non-human. Everything that's non-human. Yes. And that it becomes a friend, not yes. ally. Whether, it, whether it's trees or geese or large horses with attitude or mm. black fluffy baby bunnies, <laughs> they're all part of the natural world. We share it with them and we have to connect with them so that we can learn to live together. We, have, we do a lot of that here um, mm. when I can um because i live in this broad glorious place in shropshire uh, yes. in the stretton hills and fiona does it up at aberdeenshire where she at the moment which is glorious mountains and hills and beaches and sea and all this kind oh, of forest stuff. and everything else yes forests a lot and um when you're able to move it'll be even further north in the seriously wild country that i adore which is probably sutherland but might even be as far as caithness it might be rotten cromarty. However. Oh, 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 okay. I'll live with that. It may be confusing <laughs> since one of the sheep is called Ross. <laughs> I should get totally, totally confused. Yes. I do like Case Nest though, because Case Nest um, is, is cat land. Yes. Um, Case Cass, how do you pronounce it? Case. 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 It's, it's an aspirated T, so you blow as you make the tea. So it's not a hard T like the English T. Mm. So, right. Which is why we say K yes. um, down here. But it's Catland. And, yes. and we, we've been up there and it's absolutely gloriously beautiful. And, and it is wildcat territory. It is. and it It's one of the last country. remaining places in Britain where the Scottish wildcat still roams. Yes, although there is one down from you, which I'm not going to get involved about. That's we the, won't go there. No, well, it's worth fighting for. And yes. Can you can not, you not this blog. Cash, Cash and Darroch? Cash and Darroch is, is slightly west of me, yes. Yeah, uh, it's it's a forest they're trying, it's a... Well, they're there. trying to cut down the forest and put a wind farm on it. Yes. But it is also a breeding range for wildcats. And apparently there, there were, and possibly maybe still are, actually nearly 40 there, mm. which is, which is a significant proportion of the, the national population 
there, there may be, well, there may of Scottish wildcats, there may possibly be 50 or 60 in the world. Mm. That's worse than pandas and things. Yes. But anyway, um, we may well be going up to these glorious places, um, and in which case, you know, there'll be retreats down here in Shropshire, and then there'll be retreats up and, and yeah, got things them. up in the wild highlands, which I totally um, adore. Um, a lot of the animals here who live with me have come into my life specifically because they want to work with people. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they want to help people. She's unbelievably generous considering what we don't do for them. But we'll get to that in another block. <laughs> yeah, we will indeed. But I mean, they, and there are so many different ones. I mean, um, Fiona's got two lovely, um, quite big sheep now. They are quite big sheep now, yes. And yes, they well. are, they, I mean, well, they did start off when you first got them. They lived in, in the house for a bit. They did. They were, they were orphan lambs and they came to me at two weeks old. And they accosted an Amazon driver on the drive the other day. He got to my door and he was like, I've never seen sheep like this. They, they came to me and I'm like, yes, they've never been scared. As far as they're concerned, they, they should live in the house. They play with the dogs. You know, they follow me around. Yeah, and they're quite happy with the horses. And Yeah. Well, and they, they, even Hannibal doesn't eat them. <laughs> no, no, not anymore. He did have a go at them when they were little lambs, but now they're big sheep. He's like, mm, no. <laughs> but because they've never, they've never lived in a flock with other sheep. Mm -hmm. They've never been chased around their field by a sheepdog. Yeah. Um, we'll come to that one in more detail in an, another oh, well, yeah. session. Because there's lots but of again, other ways of doing that, yes. You know, as far as they're concerned, strange people are just new people to be hunted. Mm. Here is my ear, scratch behind it, please. And there are, there are three completely insane, glorious dogs. Yes. There are um, currently billions of bunnies, um, but there <laughs> won't be. There, there'll be two bunnies. <laughs> yes, there's um, about 12 bunnies at the moment. There's one hell of a lot of ferrets at the moment, which is unfortunate, but there will be well, less. There's, there's 15 ferrets at the moment, six of whom live with me, and nine are still small, squirrely things in a nest. Who probably will mostly be uh, departing. Oh, they will be rehomed in due course. Yes. Yeah. So there are all sorts of different critters who yes. will help you on your vision quest. And they do because they already do this, even though you can't meet them physically in some of the work that we do. Yes. So there's all this kind of stuff that we introduce into helping you be you and helping you reclaim your power. One um, of the reasons that we like you to come out of your setting and come to us for, for a retreat is because although you need to learn how to become your, how to connect with yourself in your normal surroundings, it's a lot easier if you do the first steps without all the distractions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Once, once your feet are on the path, you can walk it. But if you can't find it because there's too many signposts, it's, it makes life unnecessarily difficult. And also, when you come to us, there's us, or at least one of us. Yes. And the other people who've come with the same idea, the same intention. So you're not alone. Yes. And you can all help each other find your place, find where you're going. Yes. And so there's all of this, all of this stuff. Anyway, my darling, I think it's time to um, shut shop. For this week. For this week. We'll, we'll do it the next week. Next week indeed. Yes. And it's um, been lovely chatting with you. I hope you've been useful. And we'll see you next week. Look forward to it. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.